giant hole opens up in the skies of Shinagawa. Hiro's mother, Ayaka, tells him that it's a dimension quake. Something terrible is about to go through it. A creature called Imagine, a terrible, dreadful foe. Its very presence is able to shake up the fabric of space and time around itself. Ayaka points at the hole in the sky and instructs Hiro to pull in the evil god. Hiro isn't confident that he can pull it off, but Ayaka gives him the courage to try. They come from a long line of Mystic Arts users, and she's sure that Hiro possesses the very same power. Hiro looks around himself and sees people fleeing in fear. He finds the resolve to try. He pumps himself up, and he runs straight into the hole. Ayaka watches with pride as her son jumps a hundred feet into the air. No matter what people say, he isn't inferior to anyone. A few hours later, a sharply dressed woman investigates the aftermath of Hiro's collision with the Majin. Her secretary informs her that they have witness reports of two unknown entities colliding where the class one evil god was said to have been detected. The woman orders them to redouble their efforts and find out anything they can about what happened here. A class one evil god doesn't just disappear in a matter of hours, and even then, multiple S-rank irregulars are needed to battle it. She looks up at the rainy sky and wonders who managed such a feat. One year later, Hiro attends Aurain High School to begin his new high school life. His old friend from middle school, Ikigo, gives him a friendly slap on the back. Hiro is overjoyed to see him, and even more so when Ikigo still remembers him. Ikigo finds his comment strange. They've only been apart for three weeks. Their other mutual friend, Matsuri, greets them good morning. They happily chat on their way to begin their new lives, and Ikigo teases Hiro over having such a cute childhood friend like Matsuri. Shizu, one of Matsuri's friends, greets him seemingly for the first time, but Matsuri points out that they were already classmates in middle school. Embarrassed, Shizu explains that she just didn't have a good breakfast, and she apologizes for being forgetful. Sometimes she even forgets to put on underclothes. Hiro pretends not to be bothered about being forgotten, causing Matsuri to scold him. She encourages him to speak his mind and express his true feelings. Hiro smiles. Matsuri is still her usual self, and she hasn't forgotten about him either. Matsuri and Shizu are called by their other friends, and they say goodbye for now. The mood suddenly turns serious. Ikigo asks Hiro if he's still feeling down from her rejection the year before, and Hiro shakes his head. He's over it. Hiro walks away, but it leaves Ikigo thinking. He was so sure that Hiro's confession would go well, so he wonders if the problem lies with Matsuri herself. When school ends, Hiro is surprised that Matsuri is waiting for him outside the school gates. She puffs up her cheeks. She's been waiting for him all this time. On the way home, Hiro talks about moving into his new home that his grandfather prepared for him. Matsuri, feeling guilty for rejecting him the year before, tries to make amends by apologizing to him again. Not now, Matsuri. There's a car on the way. Hiro pulls Matsuri closer to his chest to save her. If she knew that she'd feel this way whenever he pulled her in, she would have given him a different answer. When Hiro asks her what she was going to say, she changes the subject and asks him what he did for spring break. She went over to the dojo several times, but never saw him there. He explains that he was searching for his father, who is currently on a training journey. Hiro still hasn't been able to tell him that Ayaka disappeared after the Shinangoa incident. Hiro says goodbye to Matsuri for now, as he still needs to pack his things to move. Hiro runs home, still delighted that Matsuri hasn't forgotten a single thing about him. Being remembered is such a simple thing, but it is something so significant. Hiro resolves to protect this life. Unfortunately for him, it won't be that easy. He arrives at his new home, but it's a dump. The locks are broken, the house is falling apart, and the tiles in the bathroom are chipped. This looks like the setting for a high school amateur horror film. Hiro curses his grandfather for giving him such a horrible place to live. Hiro's grandfather, Tenzo, sneezes. His colleague, Sunway, asks him if he made the right decision, leaving Hiro all alone, but Tenzo tells him to have faith in his disciple. It is revealed that Hiro has a unique condition that leaves him unable to use his family's usual techniques, but this leads him open to learning the techniques of other disciples. Tenzo is glad because whenever Hiro uses a specific technique, he disappears from people's memory. Unfortunately, Hiro is barred from ever living a normal life due to his circumstances. As a member of the Domori clan, he is tasked with guarding the entrance of a deep cavern that spawns endless hordes of monsters. It is both a great responsibility and a great burden. Meanwhile, Hiro spends the entire afternoon doing what he can to make his new house livable, but he is forced to live in a tent in the meantime. While taking out the trash, he notices an invitation from the World Irregulars Organization. The World Irregulars Organization, or the WO, is an independent organization that manages irregulars, individuals that manifest strange powers. There is a strict selection process to determine an individual's rank, 
and based on the rank one receives, they are eligible to undertake quests and receive rewards. Hiro accepted the invitation and wore his usual clothes, but he had no idea that the exam would be held at such a lavish party. There was nothing about a dress code in the letter, so Hiro isn't really at fault here. Regardless, some partygoers mistake him for a staff member or a poor lad who just wandered in. Undeterred, Hiro Psyche is himself up. If he can get through this exam, he can get a regular job from the W.O., which means a steady flow of income. He can't wait to have a meal that isn't cup noodles. A man accidentally bumps into Hiro, but he continues to walk up to a woman named Mizu, a beautiful woman and heiress of the esteemed Shaiji family. The man introduces himself as Hideo of the Ko family, and Mizu apologizes to him. She quickly forgets people who don't interest her in the slightest. Hideo brings up the public challenge that whoever can defeat her in battle gets to marry her, and Mizu dares him to try. She'll show him that the difference in their levels is just too far apart. As their argument risks turning into a full-blown battle, Hiro steps in to intervene, and he asks them both to calm down. The pair are startled by his sudden appearance, and Hiro meekly introduces himself as a fellow examinee. Mizu senses something strange about Hiro. He's leaking quite a bit of spiritual power. Hideo interprets this as a sign of hostility and grabs him by the collar, but Hiro explains that his body has a condition that forces him to expel excess spiritual power. He's unable to control it at all. Hiro has made a laughingstock of the entire room. Someone who can't even properly control their magical power has no place at the W.O. exam. Hideo finds this hilarious, and he advises Hiro to go home before he embarrasses himself. He calls Hiro a failure, and the whole room joins in laughing at him. However, a certain man notes that Hiro's movements earlier were nothing short of spectacular. Not long after, a woman named Hisi, acting as the MC, explains the details of the exam. The exam will measure several parameters including academic ability, fighting ability, spiritual power, magic powers, or unique skills and decision making. Hiro starts sweating the moment he finds out that there will be an actual academic test. To his horror, his specialty, fighting, makes up only 5% of the total exam. She introduces their guest examiner, Alfred Arclight, the famous sword saint nicknamed the Demon Killer. Arclight gives a small speech to wish the examinee's luck on the exam, prompting Hiro to try and slink away. However, Arclight speaks to him personally, applauding his bravery for defusing the situation between Mizu and Hideo. Both Mizu and Hideo are hailed as geniuses in their generation and are also the pride of their respective families. Arclight tells Hiro to have confidence he, too, is just as great as them. Hiro is flattered to be praised unexpectedly, but this only fuels Hideo's hatred of him. Hiro places dead last in the academic portion of the exam. Some of them find it impressive that he managed to score 32 points. Hiro starts getting nervous. There's a real chance that he won't even get a ranking from the exam. Hiro watches in awe as Mizu appears to match Arclight in the combat exam. Arclight is impressed, and in fact, frightened by her potential. Mizu wipes up her sweat, and she tells Hiro to do his best. This is his last shot to make a name for himself. Hiro is flattered that she remembers his name, but she insists that it was just an accident. Hiro goes next for the combat exam, but Arclight's pressure is no joke. Even after fighting dozens of examinees, it's as if he still has a full tank. Without a doubt, this man is strong. There's a reason why the combat portion of the exam only makes up 5% of the total. There are several body strengthening techniques among all mystic arts disciplines, which usually renders raw physical training mood. This also targets Sendo users like Hiro. Arclight unleashes the full might of his pressure, and he'll give Hiro a special treat. He'll go all out from the start. He challenges Hiro. If he can survive for three minutes, he'll adjust the weight of the battle portion of the exam just for him. Mizu protests, and she advises Hiro to forfeit. Hiro will do no such thing. What drives this man? Is it his pride, his family, or his love life? No, it's the desire to live a life with a stable income. Before Mizu can even blink, Hiro closes the gap and strikes Arclight. The ground beneath them shatters. Arclight is impressed, but he tells Hiro that just because he's known as the Sword Saint doesn't mean that he can't fight with his fist. To everyone's shock, Hiro manages to match Arclight pound for pound. Arclight delivers a powerful kick to Hiro's stomach but he seems relatively unharmed. The two clasp arms, they've gone beyond the three-minute limit. Hiro has survived the death match. The limelight is on Hiro. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the strongest fighters in the world, and the question on everyone's mind right now is, who is that boy? Hiro wonders if Arclight really will make good on his promise to reconsider the weight of his battle exam. The only thing Hiro has going for him is his fists, so if he doesn't have that, he's useless. A woman named Marion asks if she can sit and eat next to him. 
Hiro is surprised that she knows him, and she explains that he's quite famous. Not because he somehow scored last in every other exam, but because his fight with Arclight has made him a minor celebrity of sorts. Hiro praises Marion's Japanese skills, and she explains that she's a quarter Japanese, though her mother passed away recently. Hiro apologizes for bringing up a bad memory, but she tells him not to mind it. She feels at ease talking to him, so it doesn't bother her. Suddenly, a blonde kid with a punchable face comes up to Marion. When she asks him who he is, he suddenly grabs her collar and reminds her of who he is. He's Jean-Pierre Dorlin, a member of the Head family. He also has the most French name in the world. Jean demands that Marion's branch family return the relic that her mother stole, Raphael's vestment. Hero puts down his cup and accidentally headbutts Jean from behind. He slipped, really. It was an honest mistake. Marion asks Jean to stop and forgive Hero, and he agrees on the condition that she kneel down and performs a dogeza. When Hero tries to protest, Jean angrily rips his shirt off, revealing that Hero is not only ripped, but is also covered in scars. That's one hell of a body. Hiro calmly gets on his hands and performs a dogeza, asking for Jean's forgiveness. Jean gets sick of the atmosphere, so he decides to leave. Hiro breathes a huge sigh of relief, and Marion apologizes for roping him into her problems. He reassures her that it wasn't her fault. It was he who accidentally slipped and headbutted him from behind. As Hiro leaves the cafeteria, he encounters Mizu. She asked him why he kneeled for Jean when he could have easily smacked him around. He tells her to look at the bigger picture, say he did beat up Jean. Sure, it'd be satisfying, but it would do nothing to solve the underlying problems plaguing Marion. She asks him if he thinks his dogeza did anything to help her, but he doesn't have an answer to that. He says that the only people who can change their situation are themselves. He was only doing what he wanted to do. When Hiro hears an announcement for the spiritual power exam, he runs off. The examiner, Elia, instructs him to stand on top of the magic circle and expel as much spiritual power as he can. He tries to tell her something about his power, but she cuts him off. She just wants to get this over with. Since Hiro can't exactly control his spiritual power, he isn't able to release it like the examiner wants. He wonders if this will be okay. Elia expels some magical power of her own to correctly measure Hiro's spiritual power, and the effects are, for lack of a better term, euphoric. Elia goes weak in the knees, remarking that Hiro's spiritual energy is exceptional and dominant. Thirty minutes pass with Hiro just standing there, leaking energy. Elia tells him that he is free to go, though the sun has already set. After stopping by a convenience store, Hiro discovers a grisly scene bloody bodies. Hiro has a nightmare involving seeing the dead bodies of Matsuri and his friends. He wakes up in a panicked, cold sweat. He wants to control his power so that he can prevent something like that from ever happening. As he looks to the side, he sees a vision of an old companion, Lee's. Later, Hiro meets with Hissi and Arclight regarding the crime scene he discovered. Hissi confirms that the bodies were those of two non-humans, living as normal citizens with foreign nationality. Arclay explains that it isn't unheard of for certain non-humans to live among humans, and some possess the ability to completely mask their non-human side. Not even Arclay can detect them, which makes it all the more impressive that Hiro was able to. Issy asks Hiro to keep this incident a secret from the other examinees, and he agrees. Hiro leaves to take his remaining exams, and Hissi is glad that he's so cooperative. If only all young people were like him. Hiro heads to the site of his next exam, which will measure his magic abilities. Since there are several branches of magic, he is advised to go to whichever suits his specialty best. When Hiro enters the exam hall, he is stunned to see so many different techniques and indeed even weapons at play. He considers using his own weapon, but he decides against it. Marion summons a special relic, Raphael's vestment, while Mizu shows off her ability to use two elemental attributes at once. The examiners are blown away by the quality of newcomers this year, and she expects great things from Hiro. Elia's twin sister, Dola, acts as Hiro's examiner. She tells Hiro that she will summon a sparring partner for his mock battle, and she asks him to get ready. Hiro focuses his mind and raises his sendo power by one stage and one stage further. Hissi curiously observes Hiro's unique technique. It is neither magical energy nor spiritual energy. A few hours earlier, Arclight asked Dola to summon five B-ranked monsters for the sparring session. Dola thinks he's insane, but he offers to intervene if things go awry and to take responsibility if any kids die. Dola puffs up her cheeks. She sure hopes that nobody blames her for this. She summons a pack of manticores, which is far more powerful than what anyone else was expecting, Hissy included. Five beasts pounce on Hiro, who seems clueless at first that the test has already begun. Against all established strategies, Hiro rushes into the beasts at the same time. 
Mizu and Marion really think he'll die this time. The manticores open their jaws wide, and they snap down. A frantic kissy yells at Dola to undo her summons, but she's too busy telling everyone that this isn't her fault. However, there was no need to worry. As the smoke clears, all five manticores are dead on the ground. Hiro jumped into the center, so that they'd all attack each other. Hiro corrects them. He actually beat one of them on his own. Mizu marches up to Hiro and scolds him for doing something so recklessly stupid. Hiro doesn't know why she's so mad. He beat them all. Mizu angrily flips him toward the ceiling, screaming that it was just pure luck. Arclight doesn't get away scot-free either, as Hissy discovers that he was the reason why Dola summoned manticores in the first place. Hissy flips Arclight into the ceiling, smashing a hole right next to Hiro's. Moments later, Hissy receives a call with information regarding Sister Sophia's murder. The culprit is the same person behind the double murder that Hiro discovered the day before. To make matters worse, the culprit is said to be able to absorb the abilities of the person whose blood they suck. Hissy knows that vampires are extraordinarily powerful and ancient creatures, but she's never heard of an ability like that. Search parties have already gone out to investigate the vampire communities. The culprit they're looking at is Gaston. No one bites like Gaston, sucks blood like Gaston, murders innocents like Gaston. Due to the abilities he's gained from sucking his victim's blood, he has been assigned the Magin class. The abilities that Gaston gained were Sophia's Perception, which bestows the user with limited clairvoyance, Pending, which allows the user to confuse others, and Positioning, allowing the user to blend into their surroundings. These are all troublesome abilities that let this Gaston person infiltrate any organization with ease. Unfortunately for Hissy, Gaston is already within exam grounds, and he can't wait to suck. Arclight and the other examiners struggle to determine what rank to give Hero. While he performed spectacularly during the intuition and decision-making tests, he failed anything that involved magic. His academic test results were abysmal, but his knowledge of high-class apparitions and demons is second to none, as if he had fought them before. Arclight chimes in and rates Hero's close combat skills highly. Though his spirit power is equally impressive, since he is unable to use it, it might as well be useless. Dola also acknowledges that Hero's combat abilities are first class. His battle with Arclight was no fluke. The examiners struggle to determine his rank, but since there's a good chance that their tests can't accurately measure Hero's value, Hissy decides to veto making a decision for now. Later, Hissy asks Arclight if he knows anything about Hero, since he seems so interested in him. Arclight reveals the possibility that Hero might be a Sendo user, a power that is neither spiritual nor magical, but an innate strength that can be attained with long, grueling training. Arclight isn't quite sure, but the fact of the matter is that Hero's fighting style seems strange to him. This further complicates how they should measure Hero. A man arrives to take Arclight to the airport, and he says his goodbyes to Hissy. Unseen by anyone, Hissy places a hand on her stomach. With the exams concluded, the WO holds a special dance party to celebrate. Hero feels like a fish out of water. Marion approaches Hero and asks why he's in the corner, and he explains that he feels a little out of place. Hideo sneers and says that this is no place for someone like Hero. He asks Mizu if she thinks the same way, but she thinks the exact opposite way. She has a gift for Hero, and with a snap of her fingers, some of her men carry Hero away. Marion is worried that Hero is going to be murdered, but Mizu reassures her that she's just making up for throwing him through the roof. If anything, Mizu is surprised that Marion gets along with him. She replies that Hiro is quite easy to talk to, with a contagious smile and a never-wavering sense of optimism. She even thinks that Hiro may be stronger than her. Mizu glances away. She understands what she's talking about. Moments later, girls start chattering about Hiro's new appearance, signaling that Mizu's gift has done its work. Hiro returns in a stylish tuxedo, and it's amazing what a change of clothes can do for a man. Marion compliments how great Hiro looks now. But Mizu is less than honest, even though she was the one who got him the tuxedo in the first place. Elsewhere, a jealous Hideo gnaws at the edge of a dining table. Hissy steps on stage and congratulates the examinees for powering through their rigorous test. She announces that every single person in the room has passed the exam and received a rank. Hiro jumps for joy. Hissy goes on to announce the two top-ranked examinees, Mizu and Marion, both of whom receive rank A Hideo. Despite all his character flaws, is also ranked A. The examinees receive their certificates and are congratulated by their peers. Hiro congratulates Marion for passing, but she credits him for giving her the strength and courage to do her best up until the end. Hiro slowly realizes that his name hasn't been called yet, but he doesn't mind getting a low rank if it means that he still gets to work. His name is eventually called, revealing that he received a rank of D, despite receiving glowing reviews in fighting ability and intuition. 
his academics, spiritual power, and magic dragged his overall score down. Hiro receives his certificate from Hisi, and she tells him not to feel too down. D rank is already plenty impressive, considering that, last year, the highest awarded rank was C, which was given to Jean. Hiro passed, and that's what matters. He can finally earn money for himself and return to his normal high school life. Suddenly, a chill runs up his spine. He gets an extremely uncomfortable and unsettling feeling, but neither Mizu nor Marion notice anything amiss. They tell him that it's just his imagination, but Hiro knows that this feeling of dread is genuine. It's the same feeling he got when he discovered those bodies. He tries to scan his surroundings. Where is that feeling coming from? When he hears a voice recognizing his face, Hiro yells at everyone to get away. When Hissy steps down from the stage, she receives a call, warning her to stop the exam at once. The vampire community sent an emergency message, revealing that the bodies that Hiro discovered were assassins sent to kill Gaston. Hissy learns that Gaston intends to steal the abilities of their new recruits, and right now, nobody is safe. Right now, Gaston is inside the exam facility. It could be anyone. Hissy thinks fast to try and figure out where Gaston could be and who his next target could be. When she receives word that their data storage was broken into, she realizes that Gaston could be targeting based on the results of the exam. Just as she is about to issue an evacuation order, Hiro beats her to the punch. Hiro attacks a well-dressed man, but to his and everyone's shock, Hiro is effortlessly thrown into a wall. The golden boy is suddenly a non-factor. The man moves toward Mizu and Marion, prompting Hissi to defend her kids. She tells them and everyone else to leave the room, warning them of what Gaston is. Gaston's targets are Mizu and Marion. He's a vampire, and not the sexy kind. Everyone falls back, and Hissi gives the order to recall Arclight from the airport. In the meantime, she'll do her best to hold him off. Hissi asks Gaston if he was the one who killed Sophia, and he breaks out into laughter. What a silly notion. He denies it and claims that, in the first place, Sophia was already at death's door, and he can't have that. Gaston appears to have some sort of connection with Sophia, and based on his sudden mood swings, Hissy concludes that he isn't right in the head. Gaston admits that he sucks Sophia's blood so that she'd always be inside him. However, what Gaston didn't expect is that he would gain control of her powers, so he knows that Hissy intends to hold him down here until someone called the Sword Saint shows up. The situation has gone from bad to worse. Gaston is far more powerful than Hissy could have imagined. Not only is he blessed with a vampire's physical and magical strength, but he also has over 50 different special abilities, including Sophia's mind-reading powers. No secret is safe from Gaston. The demon class truly fits him. However, Hissy's no slouch either. She is still a demon killer class ability user, though she didn't get there on her own power alone. Mizu accepts her resolve, and she leaves with Marion. Mizu is confident that Hissy will be okay. She's like a big sister to her, and she knows that she's no pushover. Right now, their goal is to make sure that Hiro is okay. As they start to dig him out of the rubble, Hiro suddenly stands up, with nothing more than a few bruises and a ruined tuxedo. Meanwhile, Hissy battles Gaston to keep him occupied. However, thanks to Gaston's mind-reading ability, he knows exactly where Hissy is aiming, and he easily closes the distance. But not if Hiro has anything to say about it. Hiro attacks Gaston, and he is genuinely surprised. He didn't sense Hiro coming it all up until the last second. Gaston raises an eyebrow. Didn't he just throw Hiro into the wall? Hiro asks Hissy to leave the vampire problem to him. He happens to be good friends with a whip-cracking vampire hunter, so he knows a thing or two. Hissy turns around and is confused to see that only the examinees are left behind. Many of them come from affluent families, yet none of their servants are around. Hiro asks Hissy if she gets the strange feeling that Gaston seems like a friend. This is likely one of Gaston's powers at work, positioning, which causes people to view him as an ally. While Hiro acknowledges that this may usually be the case, he shares that when he first saw the dead bodies in the East Wing, his instincts told him to run away as fast as possible. Thus, he asks them to try thinking of leaving the room. Mizu and Marion do as he asks, and both of them are gripped with a sense of fear and dread, but Hissi is fine. Hiro claps his hands and snaps them out of it. Hiro shares his findings. While Mizu and Marion get the feeling that they'd die if they left the room, Hissi and the other adults get the feeling that they should get out of the room as fast as possible. Furthermore, the examinees seem to be under an illusion that prevents them from finding the exit. They are in a state of confusion, which is Gaston masterfully using his positioning power to manipulate how they think. Gaston applauds Hiro's deductions, 
though he doesn't recall seeing Hiro's name on the database. He knows that Mizu and Marion are both ranked S, so he asks Hiro what his rank is. Hiro proudly replies that he's ranked D. Gaston finds this impossible because Hiro seems to have plenty of experience fighting mind readers based on the fact that his brain is filled with images of girls in swimsuits. Mizu and Marion start seeing him in a different light. But Hiro swears that this is just a countermeasure for mind readers. Kissy tries to attack Gaston, but none of her attacks will land as long as his mind reading ability is active. Gaston tries to punch back, but he stops his fist short, just inches from Hissy's stomach. He reads her mind. She's pregnant and she hasn't told the father, Arclight. This explains why she isn't mustering her full power and why she consulted with Sophia weeks beforehand. Gaston tells Hissy to stop resisting, threatening to kill not only her but her unborn child. Mizu attacks with her searing flames, but Gaston effortlessly dances around them and grabs her face. There's no hiding secrets from Gaston. He knows that Mizu struggles to deal with men, and that most of the men who do propose to her are mostly after her position within her family. Mizu isn't seen for her prodigious ability, but for the potential status marrying her will bring. Mizu angrily enters close quarters, which is a foolish mistake for a long-ranged specialist like her. She learns this the hard way, as Gaston kicks her in the stomach. Marion comes to Mizu's aid by attacking Gaston with some holy water, and for once, Gaston shows some hint of fear. Gaston avoids the attack and grabs her by the throat. He knows that she is a kind girl and can't stand seeing others get hurt, just like when she berated her mother for allowing their father to die. Suddenly, Hiro kicks Gaston into the wall, punching a large hole into it. Marion struggles to get up, and she hears Hiro's kind voice, the voice that's been saving her for the past three days or so. Hiro tells her to take Mizu and escape. He's done playing around. It's game time. He calls Hissi's name and tells her to collect the other students and drag them away by force if necessary. They can't afford to lose any gifted people, which is why, as the lowest ranking student here, Hiro promises to hold Gaston here at all costs. Hissi accepts his plan, but she tells him to make no mistake he too is an important piece in all this. Mizu gives him an encouraging slap on the back, threatening to kill him if he dies. Marion, too, tells him to return in one piece. Hiro does some stretches. It's time to get serious for real. Gaston climbs out of the rubble, clearly angrier than before. He isn't letting anyone leave here alive. Everyone's going to be his meal, one way or another. When Gaston first appeared in the exam hall, Hideo considered fighting back, but when he saw that the dude was a vampire, he noped out. However, due to Gaston's positioning power, Hideo was unable to see the door, and a sense of dread filled his mind. However, when Hiro kicked Gaston through the wall, Gaston's spell over them is broken, and they return to their senses. Hideo, seeing Mizu, uses this chance to try and raise her up, forgetting that there's a master vampire in their midst. Hiro punches Gaston to shut him up, and he tells everyone to hurry up and leave. Hideo grits his teeth, but he has to admit that Hiro is their best shot at getting away. Hissi tells Hiro to hold on until Arclight arrives. Gaston is outmatched, outgunned, and outclassed in close quarters. He seriously doubts that Hiro is a D-rank ability user. Hiro managed to get the better of Gaston in their first exchange, but he is wary of the exceptional, regenerative capacity of Vampire. He knows that if this fight drags on, he'll eventually be at a disadvantage. Gaston, too, feels the pressure. He's pushing his body to its limits, but Hiro appears fine, as if he's a seasoned veteran. He knows that there's something special about Hiro, and whatever it is, he wants it. Hissy completes the evacuation, but Arclight is, hilariously enough, stuck in traffic, so he won't be here for a while. Hissy knows that Hiro won't be able to last forever. While she tries to calm down some students who are afraid this will affect their grades somehow, Mizu and Marion discuss what just happened. None of the students are concerned about how they were saved, but Marion doesn't blame them. None of them have any experience being in an actual, life-or-death battle. Hideo returns with something to drink for Mizu, but she doesn't want it. She and Marion sprint back inside the exam facility, causing a frustrated Hideo to dump his drink on the ground. Hiro and Gaston continue their battle, and as expected, Hiro begins slowing down. Gaston sees an opening in Hiro's heart, but before he can pull the trigger, both he and Hiro hear something. Someone who hasn't been evacuated yet. Gaston immediately throws a huge chunk of rubble at her prompting Hiro to run as fast as he can to rescue her. However, it is Mizu and Marion who come to her rescue. Marion treats the girl's wounds and leads her to safety, and they join up with Hiro. Gaston cracks a ravenous smile. Yeah, baby, as Hiro joins up with his friends, Gaston raises his hands. It's time to begin the show and to peer into Hiro's past for the whole world to see. Gaston takes a close look inside Hiro's mind, 
but mind-reading hearts is another matter. To successfully peer into the depths of one's psyche, one must either be intimately close with the person or destroy the walls surrounding the person's heart. Saying terms or words related to what the person is thinking about makes it easy to make their heart waver. Gaston openly calls Hero a nice person, a white knight if you will. He has a strong sense of justice, but Gaston twists this around and calls in Maeve. He reveals that one day Hero showed mercy to an enemy, which directly led to everyone he loved and cared about being killed. As a bonus, Gaston learns that Hero also lost his mother during the Shinagoa incident. It is truly a pity. Gaston taunts Hero in an effort to weaken his resolve, but Hero has survived worse. However, when Mizu and Marion turn around, they see something truly shocking. Hero looks as though his heart has been shattered. At that moment, upon hearing his sins being laid bare, Hero wanted to scream or cry, but he couldn't even make a sound. Mizu and Marion shout and give Hero some words of encouragement to give him some strength back, but then they turn to face Gaston. They won't forgive him for hurting such a kind person. Mizu and Marion each use their respective trump cards, Mizu's twin elemental blast and Marion's holy smite. Gaston is engulfed in the combined power of their attacks, and they are confident that the immortal vampire, who literally absorbed 50 different powers, including mind reading, couldn't have possibly walked away unscathed. Marion and Mizu praise and commend each other for their respective attacks, but it is a premature celebration. Gaston did, in fact, walk away from that unscathed. Marion and Mizu are caught unaware, and they brace themselves for certain death. However, this time, it's Hero who comes to their rescue. He puts Gaston into a full Nelson, WWE style. Gaston swings his body forward, causing Hero to crash into the wall again. Gaston walks up to Hero and tells him that he'll never be able to make up for his sins. What's done is done. The people he loved died because of him. As Gaston hammers in this fact, Hero falls into despair, and he slowly loses his mind. As he crumbles to the ground, Gaston is confident that he's finally broken him. Everyone dies in the end, so Gaston believes that it is best if they live on by being part of his blood. Gaston turns around and returns to the more pressing matters. Mizu and Marion suddenly lose their legs, which Gaston interprets as them being too scared to move. But wait, where are they looking? An unbelievable amount of killing intent floods the room, which is enough to make even Gaston's ancient hairs stand on their ends. Gaston turns around, and an incredible amount of memories start flooding into his brain. Not even he can control it. Gaston drowns in Hero's memory. When he opens his eyes, he finds himself in a strange, unfamiliar house. When he looks up, he sees Lee speaking to Hero. Gaston realizes that he is within Hero's memories, showing moments with his cherished friends and that fateful day in Shinigawa. However, for some reason, Hero appears to have given up on these connections. Gaston settles in, grabs some popcorn, and watches as Hero's life unfolds before his eyes. Lee's asks Hero if he really intends to use that power. Hero somberly tells her that he has no choice. He has to use it if he wants to defeat the catastrophic Magin class monster. Lee's tries to convince him not to use that power. It will enable him to cut down the Magin, but it will also sever his ties with his friends and loved ones. Everyone will forget who Gi is. She asks Hiro if he's really okay with that, but all he can do is weakly smile at her. Lee's realizes that he already made up his mind long ago. Knowing that she can't talk him out of it, she decides to cheer him on instead. She encourages him to use his final weapon, promising never to forget him, even if he does. Hero is filled with relief. He embraces Lee's and thanks her for her unwavering support. Gaston might be an immortal, serial killer vampire, but his heart isn't made of stone. When he learns that Hero has effectively chosen to live a life of solitude in exchange for saving the world, he pities him. A ferocious roar echoes throughout the sky, heralding the arrival of the catastrophic Magin. This is Hero's chance to finally end it once and for all. However, the Magin manages to persuade Hiro to hold his hand for just a moment. This moment of hesitation costs him dearly. The Magin escapes. Hiro later apologizes for wasting Lee's efforts to trap the Magin, and she forgives him. Being kind is one of his strong points, so Lee's isn't surprised that things turned out this way. Later, Hiro discovers Lee's dead body in the middle of the field. He cradles her body in his arms and sobs heavily. But Magin's voice speaks to him and blames him for what happened. It's Hero's fault for not killing the literal devil in the first place. Hero demands that the Magin show itself, but it is no longer here. However, it has taken the souls of those that were slain and Hero is forced to live with that pain. Hero won't make the same mistake twice. When the chance presents itself, he swears to kill the Magin. Gaston learns the truth. Beneath Hero's kind exterior is an unfeeling heart of vengeance. Gaston tries to shake himself out of this dreamlike state, 
but he bears witness to the moment Hero completes his revenge by slaying the Magin. But even so, his revenge did nothing but add another body to the pile. As Hero looks up, he sees Lee's spirits proclaiming love for him, despite all his flaws and all his hurts. She tells Hero to live as himself and to never lose sight of his heart, promising that she and all his former friends will watch over him forever. Gaston drops to his knees. Although it was only a second in the real world, his mind was forced to process years of memories all at once. The whiplash is severe. Hero takes a few steps forward, but he doesn't stop at Gaston. He walks toward Mizu and Marion instead. He apologizes for scaring them, and he knocks them both out with swift chops to the back of the neck. He carries them to safety, and he brings out his trump card, his twin swords of fate. Mm. Elsewhere, Tenzo senses that Hiro has broken the seal over the swords. He doesn't know how many times he has used it, but he knows that Hiro's friends no longer remember him. It is tragic. Within Hiro's body lies the powerful spiritual power of the Domori family, and the magical power of his mother, the once queen of the demon realm. Using both powers at the same time grants him limitless power, but his very existence is used as fuel for the fire. No one will remember him after he uses it, but if just one person does, it is enough to trigger everyone else's memory. Whoever remembers him when everyone else has forgotten will be the one who saves him. Elsewhere, Matsuri looks to the sky, and she thinks of Hiro. Matsuri holds her pillow tight and wonders what Hiro is doing right now. Suddenly, she feels something in her head shatter. Her memories of Hiro are slowly slipping away, a phenomenon that isn't new to her. The same thing happened at Shinigawa. Hiro is slowly disappearing. Matsuri slaps her cheeks and commits Hiro's name and face to memory. He's someone deeply important to her. He's an important childhood friend, and she'll never forget him. Meanwhile, Hiro holds his swords of fate, each one representing one of his halves. Hiro walks back on his promise to hold Gaston here until Arclight arrives. He'll finish Gaston off himself. Hiro disappears for a brief moment and returns something to Gaston. It's Gaston's arm. Gaston panics and rolls around on the ground, but that maneuver only works if you're on fire. It won't grow back his arm. Gaston's vampiric regeneration powers don't work. Hiro has also cut off the magic that allows it to function. A terrified Gaston slowly backs away, calling Hiro a monster and demanding that he get away from him. Gaston begs for mercy, reasoning that he has nothing to do with Hiro's past. All he wanted to do was suck on some blood. Hiro snaps at Gaston. Nobody is here for him to eat. He has food at home. Hiro cuts down Gaston with his swords, and in Gaston's final moments, he thinks of Sophia. All he wanted was to be with her forever. Orbs of light drop from Gaston's corpse, and as one of them comes into contact with Hiro, he peers into his memories. Gaston is revealed to have been a longtime suitor of Sophia, regularly bringing her flowers even as she advanced in age. On her deathbed, Sophia asked Gaston not to allow himself to be stricken by grief and to love humans, and she even encouraged him to find someone new to love. When Hiro sees Gaston's corpse clutching Sophia's old rosary, he realizes that Gaston was telling the truth. Sophia passed away from old age, and he only sucked her blood after the fact. However, Sophia's death was more than Gaston could bear, and it broke him. Hiro realizes that they're one and the same. He sighs, brings out one of his swords, and stabs his hand. He sprinkles some blood over the rosary in atonement. After this arborous ordeal, Hiro returns home, fully expecting nobody to remember him. But they do. Matsuri, Ikigo, and Shizu are there waiting for him in front of his home. When Hiro asks them what they're doing here, they explain that Matsuri dragged them to his house under the pretext of celebrating his moving into his new home. Hiro, still unconvinced, asks them if they really remember him. Matsuri runs up to him, hoops him on the nose, and says that she does. She'll never forget him. This time, it is Hiro who remembers. Matsuri has never forgotten him, not even once. Thanks to her, he still has a place to belong. He cries tears of joy, and he thanks Matsuri for being there. Gaston hates to interrupt their little reunion, but he feels that he has to step right in. When Hiro's friends ask who this strangely dressed individual is, Gaston explains the whole situation, using his powers to make them more suggestible. Hiro extends his hand to Gaston. They now know each other's pain and suffering, so they're tight as hell. Gaston suddenly starts crying too. Even though he's been alive for centuries, this is the second time he's ever had a best friend. Ikigo puts his arm around Gaston and everyone enters Hiro's house for a not-so-grand tour. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Mizu and Marion wake up in a hospital after recovering from their injuries. When they ask what happened to the vampire, Hissi tells them that the two of them stopped Gaston with Hideo's help. However, they somehow sense that something is wrong with these memories. Marion has a vague feeling that these memories will return with time. Mizu too, 
feels like she has some strong feelings, and she can even tell that she and Marion will be rivals somehow. A few days later, Hira returns to school to live out his new life. His friends come and join him on the way, and Hiro meets Matsuri outside the school gates. Hiro is back where he belongs, and for those who have forgotten him, he hopes that he can meet them again in the future. He doesn't mind starting from zero either, because he knows that somehow, they're all still connected.